Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar. So the ocean is the largest ecosystem on Earth. Both the scientific community today, governments and society in general are very aware of how crucially important it is to ensure the sustainability of our marine regions. And over the past decades, Europe has developed an impressive, impressive um, capability for marine observation, data sharing, modeling and forecasting. And Blue Cloud is playing a strategic role in this ecosystem. And that's why I'm particularly pleased today to welcome you to this webinar about uh, piloting innovative services for marine research and uh, the blue economy. So let me introduce you the project. Um, I cannot move my slide. Um, Okay, thanks. So Blue Cloud is one of the flagship initiatives funded by the Horizon 2020 program of the European Commission. It's a 36 months project that started in October 2019 with a budget of 5.9 million euros. 20 partners are uh, members of the consortium, among which uh, technology partners and pilot demonstrators. But the project also uh, includes 13 uh, blue federated infrastructures. Blue Cloud aims to become the environment for the blue community, offering access to an, an unprecedented wealth of multidisciplinary data resources and added value services for the benefit of the future marine research and blue economy landscapes. What's the Blue Cloud offer? So Blue Cloud aims at federating leading European marine data management infrastructures, though that you can see on the top of the image there with horizontal infrastructure, those uh, at the bottom, to create trusted, uh, trusted virtual space. So what we call the Blue Cloud technical framework for scientists to access the ocean data tools, services and research outputs they need to perform research in a more efficient way. Blue Cloud offers a series of research environments. So each virtual research environment includes services to facilitate collaboration between users, but also services that support the execution of analytical tasks uh, embedded in a distributed computing infrastructures and services that enable the co-creation of new virtual laboratories to realize uh, new working environments for open science. The project is uh, uh, working on five real life demonstrators that are being developed uh, and make use of existing and drive further additional uh, uh, services. They've been originally selected for their importance for marine ecosystem research, conservation, forecasting, innovation in the blue economy, not, not only in Europe, but also um, outside Europe. Uh, we have five, as I said, so one on zoo and phyt phytoplankton uh, products, one on plankton genomics, one on marine environmental indicators, uh, one dedicated to fisheries and one to aquaculture monitor. And in our webinar today, we're going to uh, learn more about the first one on zoo and phytoplankton products. So just, I'll give you just a very few words uh, about this demonstrator. So the demonstrator is processing several data resources available under different European marine networks to produce a unique so a phytoplankton product. Uh, there is a blue cloud interface that uh, through which the demonstrator will implement a workflow to apply big data analysis and machine learning to multi-source data sets. And the results in workflow will be published in a Blue Cloud virtual lab, as our colleagues from Leeds and University of Sorbonne will present later on in the webinar. 
The project also uh, is supported by 14 external stakeholders and experts in the blue cloud that you can see listed in this, uh, in this slide. And they contribute both to the technological advice to the project as well to the uh, roadmap that the project is built to ensure for the sustainability after the project ends. And in fact, uh, Blue Cloud is uh, working on a, a roadmap to present a co-created community vision for the development of the Blue Cloud beyond the project. We have a strategic plan uh, undergoing to, um, towards the successfully achieving of the vision behind the project. And uh, the, we have a plan in place that will start this March and, and we, we will end uh, next year for the um, launch and um, draft and then final version of this roadmap. There is a process, so first step has already started last year with the concept note that was um, uh, presented uh, in the summer of 2020. And that was then open for a, a public first consultation with a targeted survey that ran in the autumn. And now we are working on the first uh, version of this roadmap uh, that will be, uh, let's say, launched and started officially in, in March next month and then opened for a public consultation starting from July. This will lead to a final roadmap to be delivered uh, at, the, at the very end of the project. So we have said already engaged with a number of stakeholders so far, as I mentioned, our experts as a first instance, but then the community enlarged with an online consultation. We had a policy dialogue meeting with representatives of uh, the European Commission and uh, Directory Generals in November and uh, another workshop in, in December last year. Uh, we got uh, quite a few uh, of uh, quite a few um, respondents and comments to the open consultation so far. We have here some statistics just to let you know how broad is the uh, target stakeholders that we are targeting with this activity. And uh, we are working with a series of uh, other projects, initiatives, uh, services, and um, uh, stakeholders at large to ensure uh, the uh, blue cloud uh, services are um, uh, taken up by uh, the majority of uh, the uh, beneficiaries in this field. Collaboration with international stakeholders is fundamental. So we're going behind the European framework for interest with initiatives such as Atlant OS or the All Atlantic Ocean Community. And here are some samples of concrete synergies that goes even beyond the strictly marine domain. For instance, we are talking with the open to uh, uh, contribute, let's say, to the exploitation of data from their transport, water transport observatories. We are working with FNS Cloud to address common challenges uh, related to blue cloud fisheries and the food uh, network and other initiatives such as Cosmic Cloud, Odyssey, and Eurosea. And these are our next steps. So before leaving the floor to my colleagues, I uh, already invite you to save the date for the next event we are organizing in March. More information will come in the next weeks, uh, but we are um, organizing this public workshop to showcase uh, the status of the Blue Cloud services and uh, including the other demonstrators and um, uh, another workshop will be organized jointly uh, as part uh, of the All Atlantic Ocean Initiatives in June 2021. And that's it. So uh, I was very pleased to open this webinar. Uh, and now I, I leave the floor to uh, our colleagues at Leeds and Patricia Cabrera in particular. Thank you very much, Sara, <clears throat> and good morning, everyone. Uh, so I will just give you a short uh, introduction to the demonstrator before I leave the floor to the researchers behind the, the demonstrator. 
Ähm, So, uh, the demonstrator objectives uh, uh, are to derive a regional and global zoan phytoplankton biomass and diversity products by using uh, big data analysis and machine learning techniques. So, the importance of creating these products uh, lies not only uh, to the fact that uh, plankton communities are very good indicators for the health of the marine ecosystems, but also they have been tagged as essential ocean variables by the global ocean observing system. And they are also included within several descriptors in the marine uh, strategy frame, European strategy framework, which uh, aims to uh, uh, get a good environmental uh, status in the marine ecosystems. Now, this demonstrator started about one year ago and the methodology uh, consisted uh, first in compiling and processing several large scale uh, plankton uh, data resources from multiple uh, European data infrastructures, which uh, are our blue, blue data infrastructure, uh, to then apply big data and machine learning techniques uh, and that will uh, uh, produce uh, these products and that uh, will be validated by using ground truth models uh, using near real-time data. Now to do this, uh, the tool uh, that we are using is the Blue Cloud Virtual Lab. And this uh, provide users uh, with the access to these different blue data infrastructure, the discovery and data access. And there is also several other components that will allow to use uh, heavy com computational analysis and facilities like the RStudio server, the J Jupyter Hub, and other components uh, that allow to do, to do these processes. Uh, for the general workflow of these demonstrators, uh, first for data inputs, uh, we are using uh, uh, multiple uh, data infrastructures like Eurobi, CDATANET, EmbonNet, Copernicus, and LifeWatch. Uh, and this will be, uh, have been uh, harmonized and processed by using neural network models, uh, uh, by using the, the virtual lab. And the data outputs uh, uh, consist on three parts. Uh, so first we have uh, the global uh, key 3 d phytoplankton products. Then we have a uh, regional uh, zooplankton distribution uh, maps. And finally, these products uh, will be validated by uh, using a, a model, the scientific validation. So each of these uh, parts uh, are gonna be explained by my, my colleagues uh, in, the, in the next slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. And now we give the floor to Renish from the Laboratoire de Scenographie de Villefranche. What's happening? The slide. Oh, I cannot see this. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. I am Renosh working as postdoctoral researcher in Laboratory of Oceanography with France sur Mer, France. Today, I'll, be to, I'll talk on demonstration of phytoplankton EOV, pro, EOV products, mainly chlorophyll A. Uh, the title of my presentation is, uh, I, cannot, I cannot, can you read the, my slides? No. No, there's a thing why it's a problem with the text in, but I, I think it's only this one, so. Okay. Just, yeah, we will be Okay, I will you. continue then. Yeah, okay. we'll fix them when before okay. sending them to the okay. participants. The title of my presentation is Deriving Global Ocean 3D Chlorophyll A Concentrations Using Machine Learning Techniques. Uh, so my colleagues, uh, Rafael Zuse, uh, Julia Utz, and Hervé Klaus. Here is the outline of my presentation. Okay, introduction. 
we all know the importance of phytoplankton and uh, add their photosynthetic capacity to maintain marine food web and the sequestration of carbon into the deep ocean. These, these microalgae are so the key, these micro, these microalgae are key to biological carbon pump and mitigate climate change indu induced by anthropogenic carbon emission. Chlorophyll A is the key pigment associated with phytoplankton and is thus widely used as a proxy for phytoplankton biomass in the ocean. The knowledge of 3D ocean uh, chlorophyll A will contribute to improve the uh, proficiency and vastly reduce the uncertainty regarding the present state of marine ecosystems and their response to ongoing and future climate change. The objective of phytoplankton EOV products, EOV um, are uh, generate global 3D chlorophyll A concentrations and phytoplankton size classes. This or uh, this met, uh, using machine learning techniques. This uh, technique originally designed by Suse et al. 2016. This approach takes the advantage of both fine and vertical resolution of Argo temperature salinity profiling plots and the synoptic coverage of ocean color satellite imagery in order to extend surface biogeochemical variables to the depth and create 3D product. The beta version of phytoplankton EOV generate 3D fields of monthly average chlorophyll A for the year 2018. Uh, methodology, we have chosen multi-layer perceptron uh, neural networking. Uh, the MLP consists of several layers, input layers, output layers, and one or uh, several intermediate layers. Intermediate layers are so called as a hidden layers. Each layer consists of several neurons, which are the uh, elementary transfer function, which uh, when inputs are applied, we, it produces outputs. For our study, we have selected three, uh, we have selected four layers, uh, one input layer, uh, one output layer, and uh, two hidden layers. Our input layers, we have uh, three different parameters, uh, classified as a surface parameters, vertical parameters, and space-time components. The surface parameters are the remote sensing reflectance measured from ocean color satellites uh, and the sea level anomaly and the photosynthetically available radiation. The vertical parameters are temperature, salinity, and the mixer layer depth. This measured from BGC Argo floats. The space time components are the day of the year, it's transformed into cycles, and the longitude and latitude uh, transform in a Cartesian transformation. The outputs are the PCS of chlorophyll A from 19 depths. These are the depths which we have chosen for the study. Okay, once we have uh, trained our model, then next step is how to derive global 3D chlorophyll A from the trained model. This uh, uh, table explained how to derive the global 3D chlorophyll A from the trained MLP model. Uh, for, for that, we have a similar way we have uh, inputs uh, surface parameters, vertical parameters, and space-time components. Uh, we feed these inputs to the MLP model. Then the model derives global 3D uh, monthly chlorophyll A for 19 depths. This table, this table shows the broad picture of all the data sets which we have used for the present study. The BGC Argo data, uh, profiles of This data is, can be freely accessible from the Argo GDAC. Uh, next is uh, uh, satellite uh, uh, remote sensing reflectance, sea level anomaly, and the pho uh, photosynthetically available radiation. Uh, this data has been used for MLP training and generation of uh, uh, 3D generation of uh, 3D chlorophyll A product. This, this data has been collected from CMEMS. Then the physical data. This data has been used for the generation of uh, output 3D chlorophyll A product. Finally, we have validated our, pro we, 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 we will be validating our uh, uh, product with the HPLC document data. Uh, this is available from uh, LOV. Uh, this can be accessible with special request. Oops, sorry. 
okay the validation uh, we have around 21737 profile argo profiles which have match up with the uh, ocean color and the sea level anomaly data uh, uh, we have chosen 80 percentage of uh, 80 percent of profiles have been chosen for the uh, training and the rest 20 percent chosen for the validation then we have around 40 17400 profiles for training and uh, 4347 profiles are uh, chosen for the validation in this uh, spatial uh, geographical plot we can see two different colors the red points red dots are the uh, profile uh, Argo floats chosen for the uh, training, and the blue are the uh, position of the Argo floats chosen for the validation. Here is the in this plot we can see the validation result: uh, chlorophyll A derived from MLP versus chlorophyll A from the float. Here you can see very good uh, uh, agreement which be between the derived product and the uh, uh, observed observed product with uh, with a uh, with a uh, coefficient of determination is the 0.76 and the slope value is 0 0.93 and the mean absolute percentage difference is 21%, 21%. Most of the uh, data align in one by one line. I, I, b, 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 below 0 0.0, 0 0.01, you can see some clustering of data points. These points are mainly coming from uh, very deep waters, uh, uh, greater than depth greater than 800 to 800 meter but we are not much interested this this range of chlorophyll a because this is uh, below the sensor detection this concentration are below the sensor detection limit okay then how to use this demonstrator uh, this uh, chlorophyll uh, phytoplankton eov demonstrator is available in uh, blue cloud uh, virtual research environment uh, with a shared folder called the chlorophyll A product. This chlorophyll A product uh, consists of four different folders, input folders, uh, output for, it, sorry, input folder, output folder, outputs, plots, and programs. Input pro, inputs uh, mainly consist of uh, monthly averaged, uh, monthly averaged ocean color uh, remote sensing reflectances, PAR, uh, sea level anomaly and the physical data uh, for the year of 2018. Then outputs are the derived products, uh, uh, derived products of mainly uh, derived products. So this uh, 3D spatial chlorophyll A. Corresponding plots are saved in the, the folder plots. And uh, the programs, we can find all the necessary uh, notebooks and the models to run this demonstrator. Here is the structure of each uh, each folder inputs. So you can see the all the necessary input files, and the outputs will be stored in uh, monthly folders: one, uh, two, three, etc. One correspond one for uh, January, two for February, etc. Like like this. The programs in the program folder you can see two different uh, Jupyter notebooks and the uh, models which which are required to run this uh, demonstrator. The plots will be saved in the corresponding monthly folders in a PNG for format. To run this demonstration, we have two notebook, uh, two, two, two notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks, which are available uh, in the program folder. First one, which create the monthly field of uh, monthly field of chlorophyll chlorophyll A, mainly that it, it, it read data from the input files and they make the uh, NetCDF files and it's saved into the uh, corresponding monthly folders. If a user have similar kind of uh, monthly or uh, weekly or any data sets, they can generate their own data, their own outputs. Similar way, uh, for that, they have to uh, edit the path of their inputs and the path of the uh, output. A similar way they can produce the plots uh, using the second Jupyter notebook. Uh, th these plots will be saved in a PNG format in corresponding monthly folders. In these two figures, you can see 
the special distribution of uh, chlorophyll A. Uh, I have selected uh, two different uh, months, January and uh, July, typical uh, some winter and summer, summer months. In the winter, you can see due to the less uh, ocean color data sets, our, uh, the output product is limited up to 50, uh, 55 degree north latitudes. Uh, and during the summer, and our product will be limited. Uh, during the summer season, the, we don't have much uh, ocean color data in the southern pole, polar uh, southern poles. So the, uh, the data is limited up to uh, 50 degrees south uh, latitudes. Here we can see the uh, profile, uh, 2D spatial images uh, for, um, from surface to 1,000 meter depth uh, in 19, de 19 uh, in depth intervals. OK, then conclusion now. Uh, The phytoplankton EOV, uh, beta version of phytoplankton EOV products are available in the blue cloud VRE. Uh, using this uh, uh, demonstrator, a user can generate the global 3D monthly chlorophyll A concentrations for the year 2018 and corresponding plots using two Jupyter notebooks provided in the program folder. The output uh, NetCDF file will be stored in the output uh, folder and the corresponding plots will be stored in the plots folder. If user wish to produce their own product, they can do it uh, using this demonstrator. For that, they need to edit the, uh, edit the path in the notebook. Uh, in the short time, as a perspective, in short time, uh, we will, uh, the model will be refined in order to improve the quality of the retrieved product. The chlorophyll A concentration derived using uh, MLP model will be validated against the HPLC reference data, uh, reference pigment data. This phytoplankton EOV uh, demonstrator will be updated with uh, uh, 3D spatial uh, phytoplankton size classes soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. While I ask Alexander to get ready, we have a question for you, Renosh. Uh, I think it's worth uh, asking you already now. So it's from Cedric Pacher. He's asking what is the weight of each input variable in the prediction of chlorophyll? And if the model feeds on worldwide data, is it possible to use the same method on a more limited data set and how? Uh, I, the question is not. So clear. Can we answer um, the last end of the session? Okay. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. We we'll, we'll keep I, them there. Yeah. Can you send me the yeah. question? Um, question, please. Yeah. Yeah. And Alexander, can you take control? Yeah. Great. Floor to you. Um, can we have the next slide? The remote doesn't work. I think. Can you advance to the next slide, please? I think yeah. Okay, so um, I will speak about uh, about the interpolation tool that we have developed here at the University of Liège, and it's uh, initially it was developed mostly for physical data, but it has been expanded also to chemical and biological data in the context of, in the context of various European projects like C Data Cloud, Immunet, uh, Biology, and Immun Chemistry. So. Um, so in situ data in oceanography are unfortunately relatively uh, uh, scarce, relatively uh, um, and also quite unhomogeneous distributed. And the errors in such data sets can also uh, quite quite different depending on the data sets you're looking at. Uh, next slide, please. So the data set that we are looking here at is the continuous plankton recorder, which is quite a remarkable data set because it has a relatively good coverage over the North Atlantic. And this also goes back to 1940s and has, uh, has a quite, uh, quite, um, quite good um, coverage since the 60s and 70s. Next, please. So we use the, uh, the tool which is called DIVA. So DIVA is, uh, stands for Data Interpolation Variation Analysis. And we extended it that it can uh, handle an arbitrary number of dimensions. Originally, this was written in Fortran. We have it now ported to the, to the Julia language. 
Next, please. So um, for DIVA, you give it uh, uh, um, a set of in situ points, and then it aims to derive the, the smoothest field, a smooth field that goes close to the observed data points. But uh, DIVA itself does not is not able to take into account related variables. Okay. And this is something quite interesting, especially for biological variables, where we know there is a relationship, but we don't know. Um, uh, so we want to take this relationship into account in order to, uh, to improve our estimates for areas where we don't have a lot of data. Next, please. So in the context of the project Immunet Biology, we started to couple DIVA and D with a neural network. And uh, so essentially the field that we are aimed to derive is a sum of two contribution. One contribution is a neural network, which tries to link the uh, estimated abundance of a, of a species. Uh, it's a function of uh, different co-variables. Yeah, this is V1, V2, Vn. These are variables like temperature, salinity, or depths. And another contribution, which uh, uh, is estimated using, uh, using DIVA. Um, which take into account the special coherence of the, of the field. So neural networks and DIVA both are aimed to minimize the cost function. So we combine both approaches um, in, a single, in a single cost function. And uh, a similar F is here, as in the previous speaker from uh, previous presentation of Minosh, also a multi-layer perceptron. So where you have a set of of uh, an input layer and a set of hidden layer to produce an output. So in every, every layer essentially does a linear transformation of the input followed by a nonlinear non activation function. Next, please. So um, there are several co-variables that we consider here in this uh, context of this project. So we're using global seawater temperature and salinity uh, generated from the C Data Cloud project. And also a very simple uh, covariant, simply the distance from coast, um, just based on the presence of the coastline and computing the distance. The bathymetry from GEPCO and also uh, nitrate, silicate, and phosphate from the World, uh, World Ocean Atlas. Next. So we are trying to, um, to adopt a, a reprodu reproducible workflow. So first of all, we're using a version control uh, of, our, of our notebooks and, and source code. And at every, at every change we are uh, running, we're actually uh, making, a, uh, making the analysis in order to check that everything's working well. So with continuing integration. And something which is also fairly interesting, uh, fairly well thought of in, in Julia is that you can declare all software dependencies, direct and indirect of your source code in a, in a kind of manifest file. So this, uh, this makes it fairly easy to reproduce for somebody else the, uh, um, the code because the exact, the full dependency trees of your source code is actually encoded in this, uh, in this, uh, in this manifest file. And you can easily instantiate projects like this. This is possible in Julia, but it's also possible in other programming languages like Python and R, where you can um, export a project and instantiate it. Instantiate it. And so we use typically, uh, we use Jupyter Notebook. So one Jupyter Notebook is for the analysis, where we are downloading core variables, preparing them, splitting the data into the training data sets, and we perform the D1D neural network analysis. And then finally, we validate the result. Uh, visualize the result in a separate uh, notebook. Okay, next. So this is here an overview of the process of the workflow. So we're using the uh, Jupyter notebook uh, implementation of default science here for the Blue Cloud project. And these Jupyter notebooks pulls uh, different data sources um, and then performs the, the neural network analysis. Okay. Thank you, next. So here are some samples of results. Um, so we compute the estimate over the uh, full domain, but we typically mask the, uh, the result where, um, 
where the data covered is relatively low. But uh, the data is actually available over the, over the full domain. Okay, thank you. Thanks, please. So in conclusion, uh, I'm, I'm really convinced that the collaborative virtual research environment will have a really large potential to boost uh, scientific productivity. So for myself, I cannot imagine to write uh, uh, a large, large text with, with colleagues without Google Docs. And I think a uh, uh, collaborative virtual research environment will can, can have a similar impact on, uh, on doing research in a really truly collaborative way. I, I don't think we are there yet, but uh, a project like Blue Cloud uh, clearly show the way. Um, so we can capture, uh, or the aim is to capture complex relationship between species, di species di distribution, environmental parameters using a neural network. And I think neural networks are really well suited because they can ex essentially capture really complex relationship, especially if you make the neural network relatively deep and you can train it on a, on a large number of examples in order to represent these relationships. But in order to ensure spatial and temporal coherence, we're using constraints from a virtual inverse method as implemented in the DVI-D tool. And then we can use irregularly sampled observations. And also something quite interesting to explore in the future is also to use uh, convolutional neural networks, like in the BINK-A approach that we have done for satellite data, uh, where we can also take into account the, um, the spatial um, the spatial connectivity of the data through the conversion net network without imposing it a priori using uh, using information like explicitly link scale. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Alexander. And now I give the floor to Gerd. There are many questions in the chat, many thanks. Some of them have been addressed already. We'll take some time to reply to those who are still open or read them all out again for the benefit of everyone just after Gerd's presentation. So, Gerd. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. So my name is Gert Everard from the Flanders Marine uh, Institute. I'm today uh, representing my colleague Viviane Otero, who could uh, unfortunately not be here. And I will tell you something more about the phytoplankton zooplankton uh, interactions and the modeling that we did. And I think it's very nicely complementary to the previous uh, presentations and demonstrators that I saw, since we are uh, using a mechanistic, um, mechanistic technique rather than the data mining approaches we saw uh, previously. So the first thing that I want to say is uh, very briefly that we know that plankton in the marine, uh, plankton in the marine ecosystem is at the basic, uh, the basis of uh, the food web. So it fuels the marine food web and it's typically driven by temperature nutrient light, uh, zooplankton grazing, and its dynamics, they, they change in space and, and time. So you can, you can see this here in a, on the right hand side, we are here in the North Sea at the, at the eastern part of Scotland. You see clearly an, a phytoplankton blooming area there in the, the greenish uh, color. But if you go 100 uh, kilometers more to the, to the uh, north or to the south, you end up again in, um, in this more dark uh, colored uh, marine environment where no uh, blooming activity is taking place and that's exactly what we aim to study here why this is the case and how these different uh, drivers uh, interact uh, with each other so how do we do this we use an, an, an ecosystem uh, model and this ecosystem model is a basic biogeochemical model composed of uh, four building blocks which are the nutrients the phytoplankton the zooplankton and uh, the detritus, and this model has been described earlier by uh, Soutart and, uh, and Herman. So uh, in order to feed this uh, model, we have some nutrient uh, data available, which are nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and silicate. And under the influence of light and uh, at a sufficiently high temperature, the phytoplankton can uh, start uh, growing. This phytoplankton can then be grazed by zooplankton and both at the end of, of the cycle of their life cycle, phytoplankton and zooplankton dies off, become detritus and then decompose again uh, to nutrients. So we had these data available from uh, the LifeWatch uh, Belgium uh, observ observations, which is in a, a long running 
uh, observation uh, activity uh, in Europe and, and also in, in Belgium, in the Middle East as well. So the study area we have uh, um, in front of us is the Belgian part of the, of the North Sea. So we have here France, we have the Netherlands, and we have the United Kingdom. And then here, uh, that's the detail of the Belgian part of, of the North Sea. We have a, an, a coastal stretch of a bit less than 70 kilometers. And we divided this uh, study area in three zones, being an, a coastal zone, a midshore zone, and a more uh, offshore zone. Eh? And in this offshore zone, there is an influx from Atlantic seawater through the English uh, Channel, which is typically uh, not so rich in nutrients. And in this coastal zone, this is under the influence of the estuaries from the Skeld and from the uh, River Seine uh, from France. So what we did was, uh, first of all, we selected the input parameters uh, in our biogeochemical model. Then we calibrated this model by performing Monte Carlo, sim Monte Carlo simulations to, to find the optimal parameterization for this model. We did uh, the model fit, we quantified the model fit based on root mean squared uh, errors. And then we compared and by comparing the model predictions with the actual observations. And then in the end, we run then uh, this model in order to quantify relative contributions of each of these uh, drivers that I just uh, presented. So this is how it how it looks like. So on the right hand side, again, we have our study area here on the left, we have uh, three panel plots. So in the x axis, we have the time in the y axis, we have the chlorophyll A concentration uh, on a log scale, and then we have three panels. Uh, so the first panel is the 130 panel, which is here, uh, which is uh, for the coastal zone, then we have a mid shore uh, panel uh, from this zone. And on the bottom, we have the panel of the more offshore uh, offshore uh, locations. So there are multiple things we can see from this. Um, uh, so for the uh, for the for the more coastal uh, region, we can see that uh, that uh, the minimum and the maximum uh, chlorophyll A concentrations are uh, higher, clearly higher than those at the more offshore uh, stations. And that's uh, quite normal since at these locations we have less nutrients available. So also here, uh, here we have a lot of nutrients available. So the, the peaks in, in phytoplankton uh, production can be, can be high. That's one. Uh, second element we also see is that the, the cycles, uh, so in one year, we have only have an, uh, an autumn, uh, an, a spring bloom and no autumn bloom in the coastal areas. Whereas here, uh, when we are at the Atlantic water, so in this area, there we have the two peaks coming back. Uh, uh, we have a spring peak and we have an, uh, an autumn peak. And that's also what we know uh, from literature that normally we would have this everywhere, but the, the water that flows in from the estuaries is quite nutrient rich. So we, we, we lose, in fact, the, the, autumn, uh, the autumn bloom, the true autumn bloom. We see it a bit here, but it's not very distinct. So in one cycle, the, the, the plankton uh, blooms, it then dies off in, in the winter. Uh, and then uh, under uh, sufficient irradiation and uh, sufficient temperatures, it blooms again in the, the next year in spring. Also, what we see in terms of uh, zoo, uh, phyto and zooplankton interactions is the typical lag phase, and that's also clearly represented in the models that we that we had. So we have here in the x-axis again the time, in the y-axis we have uh, the chlorophyll A concentrations and the zooplankton uh, concentrations. And what we can see is that, uh, for example, here uh, the, the chlorophyll blooms at a certain uh, point. And like two to three weeks later, we then see that the zooplankton uh, 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 peaks. So that's that's typically what we also know from uh, the ecological theory, and that's nicely represented by the by the model uh, that we uh, developed. Yeah. Um, 
Then what we did was uh, based on the, the, the fully calibrated model, uh, we then uh, quantified the drivers of uh, phytoplankton uh, abundances. So in the, what we see here is again the time on the X axis and on the Y scale, the relative contributions of each of the, of the contributors. So what we see uh, uh, here, we have silicate, we have phosphorus and we have uh, nutrients. And we see that these contribute to the phytoplankton dynamics for about 20 to, to 40 percent. It depends a bit on the season where we are. Uh, temperature and uh, insulation, they contribute to the phytoplankton dynamics for about uh, 30 to, to, let's say, 50 percent. And the zooplankton grazing uh, for about 25 to 30 percent. Uh, so, but you can clearly see the effects of the season. So at the uh, at it depends. So there's no no constant relative contribution of each driver. It really depends on uh, where you are. That's one thing, but also at what moment you are here. And it's expected, and we know this uh, for other, for the more offshore uh, situations that, for example, nutrients will be way more important at the more offshore uh, stations than, for example, what we have here. And here we see a contribution of 20 to 40%. Uh, but in more nutrient poor waters, this contribution and this limiting factor will be very much uh, stronger. So how to use this demonstrator? Um, so we, we have run everything in the, in the VRE. So we have a folder available next to the, the folders of our, uh, of our colleagues. And everything, if, I then, if you then click there, everything is very well uh, documented in our uh, R markdown uh, code. So all our models um, are uh, run uh, in R, which is uh, also widely used by the biological uh, community interested in this kind of uh, research. So please uh, have a look uh, there. And it's very well annotated by my colleague uh, Viviana Otero. So as a conclusion, I can say that uh, the integration of these essential ocean variables, uh, we do not only see this data driven trend by our colleagues, but also uh, here we understand the interactions in a more uh, mechanistic way. Of course, and I could not go into detail here, we needed to streamline the, the units of the different inputs uh, towards one common uh, denominator, which in our case uh, was the, the nutrient uh, content of each of the, the building blocks. The data and the scripts are uh, available in this R markdown uh, document. Uh, and we know that marine uh, systems are under uh, multiple stress. We provide an approach on how to to quantify these relative contributions and to see how these contributions uh, change over time and in space. And we believe that the insight in these relative uh, contributions of each driver is of interest of the, of the Blue uh, community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gert. Um, there is a lot of activity in our question and answer chat. So, um, we had foreseen a survey for you, honestly, but I'd like to first complete them in the, the last questions we have, if you, if you don't mind. So, and then we'll, uh, I'll leave the floor again to Patricia for a, a wrap up and a few next steps. I think we have um, a couple of questions still to be answered that maybe we can answer live uh, from Ivan. And um, it, there is one about how about the workflows accessibility, if the Blue Cloud Virtual Lab allows to export workflows uh, using standards or any special standards or others, and if they are Jupyter notebook oriented, I'm not sure if um, Alex or uh, Gerd can, can help with this uh, question. Well, we we use only uh, uh, scripts in Jupyter Notebook. We don't use uh, any workflow standard uh, beyond this. Okay, and Ivan is also asking if there is any there are any review review of these scripts. But a help desk probably is a question that can be also taken forward via the any help desk we can offer. But if you want to man, comment on this. Uh, Alex already. Well, review is 
done by by colleagues in our group but it's not not uh, outside review is not foreseen but we we are of, of course open to any any comment so. okay and then there was one specific question for gert so is data is ex exclusively uh, from live watch or did you combine with other data sources no it's uh, ex exclusively from live watch what we have here yeah okay thanks uh, we'll take all those questions that have been answered in the chat and made them publicly available as, uh, let's say, frequently asked questions. And I'll give the floor back to Patricia now. Um, I don't know if you want to just introduce the survey and maybe then we, we can um, announce it and, and launch it afterwards or just present the next steps. Yes. yes. Uh, actually, there is 10 minutes left, so um, I think all the questions have been answered or maybe they can be answered while I'm presenting the, yep. the wrap up. Yep. So I think we can go ahead with the, okay. with the I'm just going to uh, present the next steps. If I can change the slide. Okay. So thank you everyone for presenting. Uh, all the details behind this demonstrator. Uh, so as I said before, we started uh, one year ago and as of now, we released the beta version of uh, this demonstrator. It is uh, still uh, in private mode in the Blue Cloud uh, virtual research environment. But as soon as uh, the refinement has been done and some papers uh, that need to be published, will be publicly available for all of you. And co uh, concerning one of the questions from Ivan, uh, yes, uh, this will be available there with uh, reproducible scripts uh, in most of the cases. And uh, the idea is that people that do not have all these programming skills can use the different components of the VRE to be able to, to do this uh, in addition to the use of the heavy computational analysis so for the phytoplankton, the next steps is to finalize the, the chlorophyll A product uh, to refine it. Uh, then uh, in the next phase, uh, the version of the demonstrator will include the second product, which consists of the phytoplankton community product, as a, the, the diversity product. Uh, for the zooplankton, uh, to do the final test inside of the VRE by using the DIVA tool and the, applying the neural network. Now for the scientific modeling, we will like to apply this model at other regional seas. And as well, there was one comment about the using, uh, that we are using only the live watch data. So the idea is to use also other, apply this model to other data in the future and to validate it with the zoo and phytoplankton products that have been developed within this demonstrator. And lastly, uh, the idea is that we, we learned today that there is also other demonstrators. So we would like to link these uh, products with uh, demos other demonstrators like the demonstrator on plankton genomics and as well uh, with the demonstrator on aquaculture. Um, and now uh, we can go ahead with this survey, please, Federico. So um, also, as Sarah explained, uh, we, there is a big component in this project to, to do the roadmap, the Blue Cloud roadmap. And for this, uh, there has been done uh, several consultations and just uh, having the opportunity to have almost 100 people today here. Uh, and because the aim of this is to have this for the Blue community, uh, we would like to hear your voice. So. Uh, please just stay for the last five minutes just to, to answer some uh, brief questions. So what is your professional sector? Uh, just um, to have an overview of the background and be able to, to understand the, the following uh, uh, questions, uh, answers. Okay, maybe we can go to the next question, if everyone 
replied. So most of you, 60% uh, researchers, and then we have a, a, a diverse uh, profile in environmental monitoring governance, policymakers, blue economy sector, students, and others. Okay, uh, next question. What blue cloud capabilities are more important for your work? Uh, the possibility of combining data from different sources, the access to IT resources, analytical tools, and computational power to process this data, or access to reproducible workflows. Okay, maybe we can see the results now. So almost half of the respondents think that the possibility to combine uh, data from different sources. And indeed, this is uh, one thing that uh, in, we can do in the VRE through the data access and service component. So this very good, but also the, the other options had uh, a good uh, amount of respondents. Okay, next question. In your opinion, for which field are the outputs of this demonstrator most relevant? The global and regional plankton population distribution maps, understanding of the environmental conditions and top-down factors of plankton populations, or the modeling assessment and management of marine pelagic fisheries. Okay, so the uh, half of the respondents uh, think that understanding of the environmental conditions and top-down factors for plankton populations is more important, which at the end is also linked to the, to the last option, which is the modeling assessment and management of marine pelagic fisheries. And uh, global regional plankton population also had a good respondent. Thank you. Uh, and I'm not sure. This is the last question, which is multiple choice. What would uh, you do with the tools available in our virtual lab? Uh, would you rerun the models available, adding new data? Would you apply the models available to other ocean regions using your own data? Combine your models with other models? Other? I don't know. So here with 60% to apply the models available to other ocean regions using your own data. Uh, with the other questions uh, also having similar uh, responses. 
Okay, and I think there is still one more question, the last one. Where do you see more potential for practical applications of the tools provided by this demonstrator? You can also uh, do here a multiple choice. Fundamental research, monitoring agencies and governmental bodies, development of new, more sustainable products and services by companies, industries operating in the blue economy, new policies for better ocean planning, management and conservation, providing information to citizens, or other. And here uh, with the 70% for fundamental research, uh, and then the next ones, monitoring agencies and governmental bodies and new policies for better ocean planning management and conservation. Okay, thank you very much everyone for answering these questions. Uh, this uh, will help us uh, to keep working on the roadmap. And uh, yeah, maybe Sarah would like to yeah. uh, take some words to close. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you all for being such an active audience. We are very glad to see such a high interest in these demonstrators. Now we leave you so the webinar will be available online. So the recording will be available online as well as the presentations you've seen. If you haven't yet, sign up to our newsletter. It's easy on the main uh, home page of the website since we will be informing you about upcoming webinars and about the launch of the demos for public access. And thank you again, a special thanks to our speakers today, Patricia, Alex, uh, Gert and Rinoch. And I wish you all a wonderful weekend then. Yeah, I'll, of course, if you have more questions, so. We have a contact form and we have a public email address info at Blue Cloud. So please continue to write us. <laughs> Thank you all. Enjoy the weekend and bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.